I want to link what I did in the last three lectures, especially the last couple of lectures, which is the theory of competition, of real competition. I want to link it to the theory of macrodynamics. And I want to show you that it provides an absolutely natural foundation for Keynes's theory of effective demand. So uh, in order to do that, I have to talk about a little bit what I did and then show you the connection to Keynes. And I, I focused last time on the mobility of capital across sectors. Remember, if there's a higher profit rate in this side of the room than that, then capital will flow more rapidly. Not that it flows from one to the other. It's always flowing because the system is growing but it'll flow more rapidly where the profit rate is higher and less rapidly where it's lower and that means the supply will rise relative to demand. It'll always be relative to demand because if it doesn't rise relative to demand then the profit rate will keep up. So it'll accelerate until it overtakes demand, brings the profit rate down here because it brings down prices and here decelerate relative to demand and the prices will rise and the profit rates will and I tried to show you that this process leads to equalization of rates of return on new investment, which is a key thing because it's the investment that moves. When you say capital, you don't mean old machines get up and walk across the street. What you mean is new machines are built more rapidly uh, in the regulating conditions of production in the sector where the profit rates are higher. That leads to this turbulent equalization of profit rates. Now, uh, and in this case, what, it's important to understand that there is a difference between the expectation of the individual capitalist and the outcome. Uh, in the book, I talk about the fact that when profit rates are higher in a particular industry, this is a survey in the um, um, Harvard Business Review, where the profit rates are higher, they just find that capital enters. By capital, I don't mean firms necessarily. There's the growth rate expands because either the firms already there figure, well, the profit rates are higher, this is a good place to put my money. Where the, you get profits, you have more capital, you want to put the capital somewhere to get more profits. So that's a good place. Others seeing that that's a good place will enter. And the, the article mentions that uh, most of them fail. Some of them succeed spectacularly, but many of them succeed sort of mediocrely and the others fail. Now, that tells you that there is a gap between the expectation of profitability and the outcome. But it doesn't mean that the outcome and expectation are unlinked. It means that they're linked in a way in which the mistaken expectations are disciplined by the outcome. And this is something that Soros calls the, um, his theory of reflexivity. The relation between expected profit rates and actual profit rates is, is by the adjustment of both because expectations can cause a, a boom and can cause profitability to rise uh, and at some point fall as labor markets tighten. But the expectations always have to be about the real. They are not expectations in the sense of just anything you think of. They are evaluations. They're evaluations made about the prospective outcomes and they are then judged in the light of the actual outcomes. Now, if you happen to get a job in business as an economist, uh, you would be asked to, you might be asked to make these judgments and I assure you that they will not say to you, oh, don't worry, you were wrong, in the long run we're all dead. That won't work. You'll be dead in the short run because they're paying you to make these judgments and they pay you more if you do it correctly. And if you don't do it correctly, uh, if you do it badly, they get rid of you. So this does not mean rational expectations. This means expectations are disciplined by the outcome. It doesn't follow that what they expected to get is what they got. Does everybody understand the difference between the two? And this is very important because this is, I would argue, what Keynes is really saying when he says, well, the effective demand, if firms are motivated by effective demand, but of course they never know whether the expected demand is actually what they're going to get and there's what he calls a higgling of the market, the higgling uh, going up and down as they adjust. Uh, now, th this for me is fundamental because it tells us that there is a relation between expectations and actuals 
and that ex relation involves overshooting, over enthusiasm. I mean, that's very clear. If a bunch of capitalists flow into an industry and most of them uh, don't get what they expect, some of them get more than they expect, but others don't, then that tells you that uh, expectations are generally falsified. But it doesn't follow that they were wrong in the, uh, in the sense that they didn't know what they were doing. They can't necessarily capture all the interactions. And the better ones are the ones who are better at guessing. Soros himself says that what he does is the reason he's successful is that he understands this process. He understands it's inherent in all kinds of economic patterns. And what he tries to do is ride the wave up the bubble, and the bubble is because the expectations are higher than the fundamentals. And he knows that, and he wants to ride it up, and when they get far enough away, it collapses, and what he wants to do is get out before. Um, when I was, uh, well, I can't say it was when I was a kid, but I remember when I was younger, Roadrunner cartoons. And if you remember Roadrunner cartoons, then if you have kids, you probably spend some time <coughs> watching these things. You know that what, uh, when roadrunners are being pursued by coyote, they're usually they're approaching a cliff and the coyote is chasing him and suddenly the roadrunner takes a U-turn, the coyote goes over the edge and the roadrunner whistles to him, he stops, but he doesn't fall. He, he stops and he looks around, he's going, where's, Ro and roadrunner goes, and then the coyote falls. That's reflexive adjustment of expectations to the reality of gravity. Now, what's important in this adjustment process is the rate of return on investment, not the rate of return on average capital. Because if I'm coming into your industry because your profit rate is higher, I'm not going to go to the old machines or the old technology. I'm going to go to the best reproducible technology. Reproducible is a big uh, aspect of that, and that's what I called regulating conditions of production, right? And that really comes from Ricardo. It's not a new idea. It's in Marx also in volume three in these obscure little things that he, uh, uh, illustrations that we, no one pays any attention to because they're looking for quotes about class struggle and exploitation, and they're not that much interested in the theory of rent. Uh, but that actually is fundamental because it makes the distinction between the average rate <coughs> and the rate of return on new investment. Um, so then that leads to the idea that investment, or at least the rate of growth of investment, rate of growth of capital, investment relative to the capital stock, is determined by the expected rate of return. Now I said, you know, capital is always growing. So what happens when the rate of return is higher? The growth rate accelerates. So it's the rate of growth of capital that responds to this difference. And it's going to accelerate where the difference is high and uh, decelerate where it's low. But it's not only the difference between two rates of return. It's the difference between the rate of return and the interest rate too. So it's actually the difference between the net rate of return. Because after all, you don't have to go into either industry. If the rate of return in both industries is expected to be below the interest rate, then you stay, you keep your capital in liquid form. You don't go in because after all, you can leave it in the bank and take it out when you need it. So holding cash is not a sign of a, a mistake. It's a sign that your expectation of profitability doesn't justify the use of that cash. And there are a lot of talk, talk discussions now, <coughs> cash held of, of abroad and all that. We were having this discussion with Krugman at lunch. Uh, so if it's true that expectations determine the outcomes, immediate outcomes, but expectations are themselves regulated by the actual output, then you have an argument that links expectations to the fundamentals. The fundamentals in this case being the profit rate, when we know what determines the profit rate. It's the relationship between wages and productivity and technology and all of that. That's the strength of the classical argument. Smith, Ricardo, Marx, Rafa, whatever. Now when we come to Keynes, so we end up therefore with the following, uh, and notice you can't read red and we don't have black, so that is a problem. No, no black. 
Okay, so let me just, um, oh great, thank you. Thank you very much. That way I can do more than one color, but I only need black, it's okay, <laughs> I think. So in K, and so in Marx we have something like the rate of growth of capital, which is simply defined as investment over capital, so it's a normalized investment, is a function of the expected rate of profit minus the interest rate. And this is explicitly uh, the argument in Marx when he's talking about business cycles. He calls this difference the expected profit rate of enterprise. Now it's a nice phrase, profit rate of enterprise, because it says this is the rate of return that's due to taking the risk of, of investing your money. Not, it's not a risk premium. It's a return to your doing active investment rather than passive investment and leaving it in the bank. Now, when we come to Keynes, so this is Marx. When we come to Keynes, we get an argument very similar to this, where Keynes says investment is a function of the rate of return minus. And this expected rate of return is what he calls the marginal efficiency of capital. Do you see the argument is extremely similar? except there are two things which are crucially different in Keynes. Uh, one is that Keynes never really tells us any link between this and the actual profit rate. And his argument is, well, I'm dealing with the short run, and the short run, this is expectations are, are very influential. This is correct. I mean, all those firms entering those industries in the short run, they were based on expectations, and those expectations are animal spirits, literally in the sense of Keynes. But in Keynes, they're never disciplined by the outcome. And one could argue that Keynes did this because he uh, was concentrating on the short run because that was where his attack on neoclassical economics was concentrated. So he never really deals with that. The other possibility, of course, is that Keynes died young. I mean, people forget this point. It is important. He was not even 60. I think he was 57 or 58 or something. You could Google it and find out. But he was very young. He had a heart condition. And under the stress of all of setting up after the war and uh, trying to have uh, uh, Bretton Woods and all the policies and stuff that he was involved in, uh, he was told repeatedly, you have to slow down. And he said, yeah, I'll do it soon, soon. And he didn't. He had a heart attack and he died. He had a second heart attack and he died. So. If he had gone back to that question, perhaps he would have linked it back because he knew very well how businesses operate. So it was not a question that could hang. But the problem is afterwards, the Keynesian literature split along two lines. One line said that the marginal efficiency of capital is linked to the actual profit rate. I'm going to say that's Garniani's line though there are other Keynesians who said that. And the other is the marginal efficiency of capital is uh, psychological. Psychological. Or conventional. Now the first one clearly links back to the classical tradition. Garniani is uh, coming from the classical tradition himself, from Srafa. He was Srafa's, one of Srafa's most famous students. And he certainly understood that uh, the determination of the profit rate depends on wages and technology, class struggle, and all of that. Uh, Joan Robinson is the other one here. And at least at one point in her argument, she argues that you can't link this. And this was a very interesting debate, you might look up, um, about the two sides. But for us, uh, what's relevant is that I would argue that this is an unfinished aspect of Keynes. And so if you do close it by linking it back to the actual profit rate, then you get a very different story. And that's the story I want to try to explain to you, actually explains uh, Keynesian policies in the post-war period, including most recently in Brazil and Argentina. Now, um, 
I want to therefore now begin the sort of elements of the classical Keynesian I'm not sure exactly what to call this, classical Keynesian political economy, classical Keynesian economics. I don't want to call it classical Keynesian synthesis because that's what the neoclassicals call their argument and I can't call it the third way because of Tony Blair, so it, it leaves us on a problem of how you specify this. But there's some characteristic elements. One, the expected rate of return is linked. I'm going to use this symbol for linked to the actual rate of return in a reflexive sense. Um, now the second point is very important. In Keynes, the interest rate is dependent on liquidity preference. There's a whole reason why Keynes chose the interest rate uh, liquidity preference, that is money demand versus money supply. And therefore, that is psychological. It's uh, subjective. It depends on how, you, how much you want to hold your money and Keynes talks about all of that. And that's not necessarily wrong, by the way, but what's interesting in the way that Keynes poses the problem, the demand for money is something that comes only from personal subjective things. It's very neoclassical. Uh, and the interest rates are determined by the demand and supply for money. I would argue that it's very clear in the classical tradition that the interest rate is the price of finance and supplied by banks. And that's a very different conception because if the interest rate is the price of finance supplied by banks, then like every other price, since banks are businesses and they're motivated by profit, every other, like every other price, this is going to have a price of production, a price which is determined by profit rate equalization. And I go through some extended discussion of different theories of interest rates, going back to Smith and Ricardo and uh, Hicks and neoclassical you know, theory, liquidity preference, uh, uh, all kinds of other subjective theories which I, uh, I urge you to take a look at in the chapter on finance. But my main point for this thing is that that implies that there is a normal interest rate just like there is a normal price which is dependent on the costs, uh, unit costs of, of banks plus a profit rate times the capital intensity of banks. This is unit costs in money, capital intensity in money. So the interest rate is a, a rate of return, is a, a magnitude which <coughs> depends on costs and profitability, normal profitability. The actual interest rate is not equal to the normal rate. That's what profit rate equalization brings about, just like actual prices are not equal to uh, prices of production. They're regulated by precisely these movements of equalization of profit rate. But this has an important implication that the interest rate therefore depends on the price level because these variables which are nominal will therefore rise, the interest rate will rise with the price level. The normal interest rate and the uh, will rise with the price level because as prices rise, the costs will rise. Costs are in nominal terms. Now one way to simply express this is to divide everything by, multiply by price here and divide these by price. So these are now real costs and this is in the input output sense and this is the price level and you can see that the interest rate will depend on the price level. I'm going to come back to it. I do have the uh, algebra here. Yes. Ah, 
Very good question. So in a bank, banks have costs. Tellers, machines, it used to be more people, now it's mostly machines, but they have buildings, they have paper and all that other stuff. Plus, their capital consists of their plant and equipment and their reserves. Because just as wholesalers have their inventory, banks have their inventory. And their inventory is their cash reserves, the reserves they need to keep the bank going. Uh, so when you actually measure, and I do this in the book, you can measure the profit rate on banks by keeping track of that information. Uh, and you see the profit rate is actually surprisingly not very different than other profit rates. Because if banks are making a lot of money, then people move from manufacturing to banks. I mean, uh, capital doesn't care where it lands. It cares how profitable it is. And so that has an uh, immediate implication that the nominal interest rate will be linked to the price level. This is known as Gibson's paradox, but it's actually something earlier called Took's law. Thomas Took did his work on long-term movements of price. And this was something well known to Marx because Took was one of the things Marx comments on, the, the puzzles in Took. Took went out to study the quantity theory of money. He believed in the quantity theory of money. So he tracked a huge amount of gold coming out of California as it moved across from uh, west coast to east coast, from east coast to Europe. And the question he was asking is wherever the gold landed, why did, oops, what happened here? Wants me to log in, but I don't want to log in. Uh, let me see where I am. I think it was this, right? Yeah. Um, so took among the things took discovered discovered was that prices do not rise according in in proportion to quantity. In other words, that the quantity theory of money was falsified. But the other thing he found was that the interest rate rises with the price level. Now why is this relevant? Modern economics calls this Gibson's paradox. And it's a paradox because if you believe in Fisher's hypothesis that the interest rate is equal to some intrinsic return minus the inflation rate, then you should, that, that it's a real rate, I'm sorry, the, the interest rate minus the inflation rate is the real rate of interest is equal to some time preference structure parameter, then the interest rate should rise or fall with the uh, inflation rate. And so this is known as Fisher's hypothesis. Always wrong. It doesn't work empirically, but it doesn't matter. Every textbook has it anyway, because it's convenient. And uh, Keynes knew this very well. So when Keynes sees Gibson's study, he says, well, this is the, the link between the interest rate and the price level is the best known empirical law of economics. Best known empirical law of economics. And so obviously it's true. But then he doesn't come back to it, so he doesn't explain it himself. Okay, so the third point is that in the, I always do this, in the classical, in the neoclassical tradition, I'm sorry, in the classical tradition, the argument is that capacity utilization will be linked to normal capacity utilization. Now what does that mean? Normal capacity, it's an argument that comes in Harrod especially, is the point of your utilization curve, capacity utilization, I mean your cost curve, which has the lowest unit cost. Because, Harrod says, firms are, are driven by the fact that if they can have lower costs, they can beat out each other. And that's very interesting because that's the same argument as in the classical tradition, that firms are driven to lower costs because lower costs gives you a possibility of setting a lower price, which means beating your competitor. And so the point in your cost curve, which is the lowest point, is your normal capacity utilization. Now, that is in actual cost curves, which I discuss in the book, the actual cost curve, unit cost curve, looks like this. This is shift one, shift two, and shift 
for me. These are the costs that would operate. Um, I'm sorry, this is uh, scale output, and this is average costs. These are the costs that you would get at different levels of output. And there's a physical limit to the output, and that's usually called engineering capacity. But economic capacity is in the vicinity of the lowest cost, average cost, not the maximum physical output. Because why would you take it to maximum physical output if your costs are higher? So this is not that different from the neoclassical idea of the minimum cost curve, except the actual cost curve doesn't look like the neoclassical one, and therefore marginal costs spike when you go from one to the other, and you can't use marginal cost equals price as the optimal point. I go through that in the book, but I also show that actual cost curves, such as in General Motors manufacturing and all that, are shaped like this. Yeah. Ah, very good coin. I'm going to come to that tomorrow because I'm talking here about the competitive interest rate. And we know perfectly well that what happened in uh, the late 1970s, early 1980s is the government began to intervene to lower the interest rate. Now I'm going to link that. We can think about this for a moment. If for some reason profitability is falling, and we're going to see that it was falling a lot in that period up to about 1980, then it got stabilized. I did show you those graphs before. Where, you know, the profit rate stabilized, it fell, and then stabilized. So they managed to keep this profit rate, which was falling, and make it stabilized by making wages fall relative to productivity. So the old raising the rate of exploitation. But that only made it stable. What they also did is lower the interest rate tremendously. And that caused a boom. And I'm going to use that tomorrow to explain why there was a boom in the time of a falling rate of profit. Uh, they stabilize the profit, but that wouldn't be enough to cause a boom. It would prevent the sort of decline. What caused the boom, or a good part of the boom, was the tremendous lowering of the interest rate. It went from about 15% down to close to zero. Now, that has a limit, obvious reason, so they've used up that limit, and then the question is, what happens next? Where do they go? And one answer is, you go abroad. The profit rate can be raised by going to where labor is cheaper. But it's not just where labor is cheaper, it's where you can keep labor cheaper. So the in tremendous incentive to invest in uh, regimes that can keep labor from asking more. And that's all over Asia, uh, and it will be certainly all over Africa. So this is not, uh, the social, institutional, and political context of this is very important to understand. That's why this is not, uh, this is political economy, really, uh, uh, that I'm talking about. Yeah. Is the same what that we might face? The, the interest rate one? If, if I'm a capitalist and, I'm, and also I'm owner of a bank and also I'm, I can invest in other sectors, uh, the interest rate that I face is the same that everybody else pays? If I'm the owner of a bank, I can borrow money at the same rate I lend everybody else money unless I'm cheating. So what a bank does is lend you money. That's the interest rate that's relevant, right? So. Conversely, when you put your money in the bank, they give you a rate of return. So the question is the difference between the interest rate you get for leaving your money in the bank, which is really the proper rate here because it's your passive return, and the profit rate that you make. And if you're the owner of a bank, you have the same calculation. I mean, it's the money that you get if you didn't use your money versus the money you get if you did use it and may lose it. That's the difference. Banks. Banks are not, owners of banks are not like, except in the movies, you know, nice people who live in a small town and all that. They're predatory capitalists like everybody else. I mean, their job is to make the most with what they have. And so there is actually for them the same logic, absolutely the same logic. Is that clear? I'm not sure I answered your question. Yeah, but that, that would, would assume that the money that the bank have in the, as deposits uh, have an alternative, alternative use relative to investment that the bankers can do. Okay, good, good point, but uh, let's not confuse the money. The bank has deposits, it can't use, it has to keep a certain amount to pay you back when you come in and say, oh, I need to buy a house or whatever, or I need to buy a car without lending. On the other hand, that money is the base for its lending. And as a borrower, the bank is no different than any other borrower. 
I mean, if you're a banker and you want to use a loan to expand a bank, you're going to do it on the same criterion as you would give a loan to a business person, you are a business person, on whether you can make more profit that way or give it to them. So there's no difference there. Think of banks as uh, taking in your money at one door, at the, you know, in the front of the bank, and then giving your money out at the back of the bank. And when you're at the back of the bank, everybody lines up the same. Yes, there's corruption, and they give, you know, we know all that. But in fact, it's amazing how uh, the criterion is the same. They want to make money with their money, with their loans. The deposits, on the other hand, they have to pay you back if you happen to walk in the door. And of course, we know that deposits provide the foundation for loans. <coughs> We know this when you discover, for instance, that somebody robs a bank. I used to uh, be always very interested where the cowboys would come in and rob a bank. And what interesting thing about robbing a bank is it causes the bank to collapse, right? Because when you rob a bank, you discover that the money that you put in there is not there. In fact, generally speaking, the money in a bank, the money you put in is not there. It's been lent out. And what they do is they keep the minimum possible to keep you happy when you come in the door based on, your, on their guess, but in the, if there's a panic, a bank run, banks collapse for a simple reason, because your money's actually not there, and they can't get it back. Then a, a panic or a run, Argentina had this very clearly, uh, in 1980s, it had it again in 2000s, uh, there's no money. No bank has your money. It has your money statistically, but not all of you can get it at the same time. Okay. John, ben, John Kenneth Galbraith's book called Money, uh, Whence It Came and Where It Went, or something like that. Wonderful book. Uh, this is uh, Jamie Galbraith's father, John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, and it's a great book because he writes with that uh, wit and style that makes it fun to read about money. Not normally the most exciting subject, but he makes it really entertaining. And one of the things he says is one of the astonishing things that you learn about banks is that your money's not there, actually. Okay, third point. So this capacity utilization issue. Harrod, Keynesians, had make the argument that output is a function of investment over the savings propensity, right? That's a multiplier, everybody knows that part, right? This is equilibrium output, and it'll be uh, investment divided by the savings propensity. Harrod says, well, that doesn't make any sense, because investment is adding to the stock of capital, which means that the stock of capital is rising, which means that capacity which I'm going to call normal output, is rising. So if investment is taken as given in the short run, then capacity utilization must be falling. Is that point clear? Because it's an old argument about the Keynesian uh, statics thing. You cannot have a Keynesian static argument. It's, it, it's stock flow inconsistent, because it implies that you're adding a, fl a stock uh, uh, adding to the stock of capital, but your output is dependent only on the flow of investment, so it's not changing. So any given level of investment will create a given level of output, will causing capacity utilization to fall towards zero. And Harrod says, well, you think about that, to reverse the problem. What is the level of investment that's consistent with the increase of the stock of capital? And that's Harrod's famous warranted path. And it's easy, I'm going to skip it here because it's in the book, but you can easily show that there is one level of investment that will give you the growth of capacity and the growth of output, but that must be a growing level of investment. Obviously, investment must be growing for output to be growing, but investment is causing capital to grow. So there is one growth path which makes both consistent, and that's a warranted path. Now, Harrod was never able to explain the stability of that warranted path. Harrod actually didn't have any real mathematics. Like many uh, people in the Cambridge tradition, he'd had trouble with algebra, simple algebra. Joan Robinson was even more so. She really had trouble with simple algebra. Doesn't mean she, she was brilliant, but that just had not part of her training. So he always had trouble with this, and people didn't actually, were not able to, to do this, but it's easy to show. This is actually solved by Hicks, 
verbally in his book on, on growth and I sort of formalize that in the book and I show you that there's a general way to, inch, to formalize this in which the uh, warranted path, so to speak, is stable. That is to say, when you go above it, which means that your growth rate is such that capacity utilization is above normal, then investment will grow more rapidly, it will accelerate, and that will bring your capacity utilization down towards normal. So you'd expect fluctuations around normal capacity utilization. And that's pretty much implicit in the classical argument that what determines uh, all of these things is the n point of normal output that defines the profit rate, the interest rate, and so on, uh, and the adjustments of capital uh, versus output come about in an endogenous way. But because when you increase investment, you increase output too, but you increase capital. So it's not that these are two separate things, okay? I'm covering a lot of ground here. I apologize for that, but I want to give you the big picture before uh, I run out of time. So that's point number three. Now point number four, I've already done, which is that the rate of growth of capital is dependent on the expected rate of return on investment minus the interest rate. But we know that the expected rate of return is linked to the actual rate of return. So we can write this as another function. I'm going to call it h. And this is very convenient because then it's a function of the normal profit rate, which we know how to deal with. It's the normal profit rate depends on wages and technology. It's Straffa's and Marx's and Ricardo's profit rate at normal capacity utilization. So it's going to be here. The normal interest rate, which is based on equalization of profit rates in a turbulent and reflexive manner. And this is everything is a way to capture the fluctuations of demand and supply. That is excess demand and all the fluctuations of the economy towards demand and supply. The fluctuations of output and capacity. and uh, injections of purchasing power. And these are the injections that are so central to Keynes. Keynes focuses on uh, the injections, but doesn't deal with the capacity utilization problem. Again, one could argue that uh, if he'd lived, he might have dealt with that problem. Post-Keynesian theory cannot. And I'm going to come back to that if I have time. It does not deal with that. It assumes that capacity utilization is always different than normal capacity because the logic of its argument requires that. But these three uh, fluctuations, this is demand and supply fluctuating around here. This is output and capacity fluctuating around here. And this is not necessarily a zero mean fluctuation because I can pump up the economy by deficit spending, creating new purchasing power. Now, when I say new purchasing power, it's important to understand it's not the same thing as deficit spending. And in the book, I discuss somewhat the differences too. But if the government prints money and spends it, that's an injection of purchasing power. If banks create credit, that's an injection of purchasing power. The difference is in bank credit, you have to pay it back. So an injection of purchasing power through the bank is a leakage of purchasing power when you pay it back. So that, those two cancel out over time and therefore bank injections only count as net injections if they are growing over time. Again, that's kind of obvious and when you measure net injections, what you do, is you take the newly created loans and subtract from it the payment, payment back so that you have net injections of purchasing power. And these are variables that you can calculate. The IMF have data on this. So we can calculate that. There's also injections that come from foreigners. If there's a big increase in demand for your exports without your imports rising, then your trade surplus rises. That's a net injection of purchasing power. That's part of the Keynesian story already. So we can track empirically, we can measure the injections of purchasing power. 
And this variable is therefore not a zero mean variable. If these two fluctuate around each other, then their difference is zero mean. But this can be a pumping up. And in the book I actually show you that if you measure the injection to purchasing power, and you can do it by adding them up and saying per person what has happened, you can see in the post-war period a steady rise per person in the amount of newly created purchasing power. And that has some implications. Remember those graphs of uh, inflation rate and all that? The post-war period is really quite striking that way. Okay. And the fifth point, there's actually six I think, but fifth point, is that the savings rate is endogenous. Now I want to explain what I mean by that. The savings rate is endogenous. Keynesian economics, when he's doing the multiplier story, typically says, this is a multiplier, output depends on investment and the savings rate. You know the multiplier sequence, so I won't go through that with you, but the savings rate is taken as constant. So here's the, how does the multiplier sequence work? There you are at a particular level of output, and investment at a particular level, so you have an output consistent with that, consistent with the multiplier, an equilibrium output. Now the multiplier goes, uh, the investment goes up. Why does that cause output to go up? Because when the investment goes up, Keynes is assuming that it's financed by new credit. So he's assuming that it's an injection of purchasing power. And he's quite explicit about that. He's assuming, uh, he, when he wrote the general theory, he didn't actually realize that. Kalecki does the same thing. Investment goes up, you get out. And then people said to him, well, Lord Keynes, why is this? Why, why is it true that when investment rises, savings can only rise by creating more output? Why couldn't savings rise by having people save more? And he goes, no, well, I'm assuming constant savings rate. And then they go, well, how can you spend, therefore, more? How can investment rise if your savings rate doesn't go up? And he said, oh, you're right. Uh, I meant to say, that I'm assuming that all of investment is financed by bank credit, new bank credit. In other words, investment, a change in investment is, is an injection of purchasing power. Now it makes sense then. If I inject purchasing power, then I have more output. If I have a fixed savings rate, but more output, then the total amount of saving rises. And little by little, that total amount of savings catches up to the investment. That's the multiplier, the sequence of the multiplier that you famously see everywhere. But that's predicated on the idea that investment is financed entirely by um, uh, bank credit. Now when you put it that way, that's astonishing. It's astonishing because in the classical tradition, the general assumption, the first level assumption, is exactly the opposite. Which is, if investment goes up, firms will save more. Go look at volume two of capital, chapter, uh, chapter what, uh, the schemes of reproduction. And here Marx has an example of simple reproduction, that is a society where investment is zero, net investment is zero, that you keep making the same gross investment, so it's static society. Then he says, well, how do we get to growth? Suppose that uh, capitalists decide to grow, then they're going to invest. But in order to invest, because he's abstracting for bank credit, they have to save more of their money. So they have to consume less and they save more. Ah, but now, and he shows a numerical example, extraordinary one. Two sector model going from uh, zero growth rate with a transition to a balanced growth path. Uh, if you follow through the numbers on that. But that's quite striking is that there, there is no multiplier. And I remember when I first ran into I'm going thinking, wait a minute, why is there no multiplier? And then it occurred to me, well, it's because if I raise investment and I raise the savings rate so that the existing level of output gives me the new savings, then there's no reason for multiplier. The multiplier comes from an injection of purchasing power and that comes from the assumption that the savings rate is constant. Now so Keynes justifies that the savings comes from households and all that, but again that's completely wrong. If you track the business savings rate, which is called retained earnings, and you compare it to investment, you find 
that business savings rate and investment move together. Why is that? Because otherwise firms would have to borrow, pay someone to borrow the money. And it's easier to do it from inside you, if you can. So at, on the aggregate, internal funds provide somewhere between 97 and 103 percent of business investment. You can, I show you the data in the United States, you can look it up, it's in the flow of funds. So how strange is it that if this is a fact that economics assumes that firms borrow all the money? And that is because in neoclassical economics, businesses don't exist as active agents. They're just simply maximizing their profit. So they don't save. The implicit assumption in neoclassical models is that all of business uh, output is handed over as wages and profits to, firm, uh, to households and then households save and the business borrow back. And that doesn't make any sense. Keynesians fall into that same trap. So very important to understand that the savings rate is actually linked to investment. Now what do I mean by linked? How is it linked? Does it mean that every time investment rises firms entirely funded from savings? All you need to say is that if they raise investment above the current level of savings, then the savings rate will have to go up to meet some of that. And that's all you need, that their rate of return, uh, retained earnings will rise if there is a gap between their current investment plan and their current savings, coming to them as stocks and bonds and all of that. And that means a savings rate of businesses is partially endogenous. Well, it turns out that that is sufficient. doesn't matter if households respond to this, though there are incentives where they do. It's sufficient to make the in savings rate endogenous. That means that when investment, when growth takes place, the savings rate also responds to the gap, what I call the finance gap. And so these elements, I think there's one more, but uh, no, these elements, broadly define the classical tradition. And you notice that they're different. This is different from the Keynesian one because of the link to real profitability. This is different from the Keynesian one because the price uh, interest rate is determined by competition, not by liquidity preference. Um, and by the way, uh, let me just make that point. Liquidity preference is right it's about money, demand, and supply, but certainly you have preferences about borrowing and lending. There's no question about that. But if those preferences lead to a profit rate for banks higher than others, capital will flow into those banks and bring that interest rate, the profit rate of banks down, and it does it by lowering the interest rate, because that's where they get their profit. And so the flow of capital will override your preference structure. The same thing with the stock market. Yeah, everybody has different ideas about the stock market. Uh, I like to think of myself as having finance people like George Soros because when he's going on the way up, I'm going on the way down, so somebody has to lose in order for him to be rich. But those preference structures get overridden by the mobility of capital. So yes, they're all true, safe havens and uh, preferences for your retirement, but if that leads to a profit rate difference, then a set of capital will appear to override if it's high or same thing if it's low. So it isn't that these preferences are wrong, they're just not determining. What is determining is arbitrage, the process of equalization of profit rates. I saw a hand, sorry, yes. Uh, so uh, this fact that you know, most of the uh, financing for new investment actually comes from the retain, retain earnings of the uh, firms, right? Does that fact go to, for instance, 19th century or uh, century, for instance, in fact, I, I don't say most of the financing. I just say, and I said it quickly, I'm apologizing because I'm racing, but uh, all it's necessary to tell this story is that the savings rate of businesses will rise somewhat in response to the gap between their current level of savings and their planned investment. So it doesn't actually matter how much. That's a more concrete issue. It depends on other factors, taxes, local, uh, uh, issues of banking and regulation and all of that. So that's all it requires. But in practice in the United States, the savings rate of banks is pretty close to the savings rate, uh, to the investment. You can track it. Uh, and in some cases, it actually goes higher than that. Why is that? Because they have retained earnings, but they don't have any incentive structure. So they end up holding cash. 
because they've made all, they have the retained earnings and they're not gonna throw them away by making an investment where the climate is bad. So typically after 2007, their retained earnings continued because they were building up their liquidity and all that, the ones who survived. But uh, there was no incentive for investment, so they just had a lot of liquidity. Um, you can go to earlier bank stories, so to speak, and definitely they, otherwise they have to pay someone money to invest, they have to borrow it. Yeah, I saw a hand somewhere. I, I just want to clarify something about I think you just said about liquidity preference. You're saying that um, if if bank capital is more profitable, capital goes into there and therefore lowers the interest rate, sort of sort of injecting more money in the system. Is that what you're saying, or did I misunderstand that? I'm not sure I follow that. Say that again. So for, you were sort of saying that. I mean, maybe I missed the point you made about liquidity preference. If you could repeat that, maybe then it'd be clear. Okay, let me, let me say that again, and you can ask me uh, specifically where. Yeah. Keynes is faced with actually a problem when he's doing his theory, and that problem is, according to neoclassical theory, demand and supply are equated through the interest rate. Now, Keynes wants to say that demand uh, regulates supply directly. So excess demand, he doesn't need, so to speak, the interest rate argument, but he has to get rid of it also. And the interest rate argument is specifically that savings adapts to finance by moving the interest rate up and down. So you consider savings as loanable funds, investment as uh, demand for loanable funds, supply of loanable funds, interest rate is the price. It's gonna make the supply and demand equal, which means that savings is equal to investment by the interest rate, which is no multiplier then, it's the interest rate that's the price variable of that. And he wants to say, no, that's not true. So he wants, another theory of the interest rate, and he settles on liquidity preference. From my point of view, what's wrong with both theories is they depend on subjective factors. So it would be like my saying, the price of corn depends on the desire of corn, for people to buy corn, and the supply of corn, which is true in the short run, but is not true in the classical sense, because if that demand and supply mixture causes corn profit rates to be higher than elsewhere, bang comes the arbitrage part and that overrides. It, all of these are there, but the arbitragers are basically fillers of these gaps. That's their job. And capital comes in and overrides that. So the, that's why the classical economists don't spend time on the subjective determination, because they understand that this process leads to an objective one, and all of the subjective ones are important. They do talk about it. Smith talks about it, Marx talks about it, it caused bubbles and booms and crises. But this underlying dynamic is very fundamental to first explore. Okay, and that's very important because it, 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 we don't deny all this determination. It's just that it's a part of the process of determining the profit rate differential and then bang, out of nowhere comes more capital or leaves. They run away too. They can go to liquidity. They don't have to go somewhere else. They can go and just go and sit in a bank vault for a while. Okay, yeah. In this framework, uh, <coughs> it's interesting to think, like, I, I believe, in, in developing banks and how they work. Like, the, the, it, supposedly it's a policy that suits a like credit to foster investment in certain sectors, but it capital moves to those sectors when you artificially prop up their profit rate. A policy that is meant to be like to a long-term policy, it cannot work in the long term. Well, I, I want to reserve that because I want to tell the story of the dynamic here. So the question of what happens if you interrupt the dynamic is a, is a more concrete issue. I'd like to reserve that for tomorrow because we're going to be talking about that. So I'm going to be talking about interrupting the dynamic, let's say, of determining the interest rate. I, you certainly can do it. In New York City, I happened for a while to live, for 10, 15 years, to live in a rent-stabilized apartment building. Now, the rent-stabilized was something where the state intervened, the local thing, to prevent the price from going to the market. I was extremely happy with that intervention until I left and moved to Brooklyn. And there I came in and they didn't have that. And my rents went up like 20% every year until I had to leave that particular place, a wonderful place. But they kept raising the rent because the demand was rising faster than the supply. In, in those areas in Brooklyn, you can't build new houses. So the supply is fixed and the price rises. 
So you can intervene, of course, but then you have to ask what consequences follow from that intervention. Uh, and I want to reserve that. If you remind me tomorrow, uh, I'll have more time tomorrow, so this week, to talk about that. Okay, so I want to have enough time to sort of lay out the framework so that you don't think that this is all... Let me just tell you the punchline, because I'm going to come back to it in more detail tomorrow and link it to the crisis. The punchline is the following. If you have an injection of purchasing power, which is a stimulus, right? I mean, it, it, let's say it's done by the government. It doesn't have to be. Discovery of gold in California was a huge stimulus, so it's not a state-sponsored stimulus. But an um, increase of demand for exports is a stimulus, not necessarily run by the state. But let's take the, the big one, the injections of purchasing power uh, coming from state finance uh, injections, uh, deficit finance injections. That pumps up the economy, and I'm going to show you formally, algebraically and formally, how that works. But let me just tell you the story. It pumps up output and employment. Not very surprising. If I give everybody more money, you will spend it. And if you spend it, you'll have all the multiplier effects that Keynes talked about with the flexible exchange uh, you know, savings rate and all that. And output will rise. As output rises in the short run, employment rises. Employment rises, unemployment falls because the labor supply doesn't react very rapidly to all of that. So unemployment falls. As unemployment falls, the reserve army of labor, the pool of unemployed, shrinks. As it shrinks, real wages start to rise faster than productivity or they slow down in their fall relative to productivity. In other words, real wages rise. Whether they rise faster than productivity depends on more concrete things. You remember yesterday I showed you that uh, the, or maybe the day before, the classical wage curve, the rate of change of the wage share versus unemployment. And what I showed you was that the, actually there is such a curve which is derived in the book theoretically. But it also has a very nice picture, uh, which is that if you plot in the United States here what I call unemployment intensity, which is just unemployment adjusted for duration of unemployment. And here I have the rate of change in the wage share. And the wage share is just a um, uh, wage rate relative to pro real wage relative to productivity, right? So we can write this as real wage relative to real output per worker. And what you get starting in 1949, you get a curve that looks like this. And then here, 1982, and you know what happens then. The curve kind of breaks up, and it, you get a new curve. And this breakup is exactly at the point of attack on labor unions, welfare state, all of that. So what you do, what Reagan actually did is shift the relation down. Now what does that mean, shift it down? If there's a particular level of unemployment, let's say this is uh, 6%, then on the old curve, the rate of increase of the wage share would be up here. And the, the line of the zero line was here. Wages would have been rising faster than productivity. And the new curve, if you move the unemployment rate this way, Wages will be falling relative to productivity. They'll be rising more slowly than productivity, but perhaps not as much as they were before. In other words, the slowdown is reduced. And by shifting the curve, you make it obviously much more feasible for capital because labor is weakened. Any given level of unemployment has a less of an impact on the wage productivity relation than uh, it does before. You can easily translate this into a rate of surplus value thing. I mean, you can see that relationship. So you have to keep in mind then this possibility. You pump up the economy, and as soon as you pump up, you keep it pumping. That should remind me to stop in 10 minutes. You pump up the economy. You create output rising, employment rising, unemployment falling, the reserve army shrinking. Then you're going to be moving in this direction. Now, that could mean the rate of change in wages relative to productivity is less negative, that is wages are growing uh, 
relative to pro lower than productivity, but not as much as before. Or if you're up here, they're now growing faster than productivity more rapidly. They're accelerating relative to productivity. If you do that, then you have an impact on the profit rate. And that depends on whether here or here. Both of these, from the point of view of profit rate, is going to raise, uh, lower it relative to its trend. But its trend might be rising. And this could be lowering that trend, or it might be falling, and this could be making it worse. So you need to be more concrete. But if this continues, at some point, profitability is impacted. And if profitability is impacted, then the growth rate of capital is impacted. And if the growth rate of capital is impacted, the growth rate of output is impacted, which means output slows down. Now, if output slows down, then unemployment comes back. And this, I would argue, is exactly what you find in um, the post-war period in the 1970s, the famous stagflation. Keynesians come in, pump up the economy. Unemployment goes down, they're really happy. Uh, Wage share goes up, everybody's happy, golden age of, of labor. Uh, but the profit rate is declining steadily in the whole thing, and this is making it worse. And at some point, that sets off a reaction which reverses the whole thing. So you can see already that contained here is a problem of the limits to stimulus. Now you can see the other side, the interest rate. You can see that if the interest rate is determined by profitability, then it can be shown that the gap between the interest rate and the profit rate will actually, uh, uh, that this variable itself will actually go down if the wage share goes up. So you have a, a problem not as bad. The interest rate goes down, the profit rate goes down, but the difference between the two goes down. So you will have a problem even at the level of the normal rate of profit of enterprise. Now, if this is so, then it helps explain something that we observe. And I want to end there. I didn't get to my formal presentation, but I just want to tell you a story, a very important story. When Keynes was trying to figure out another theory, he was troubled, deeply troubled, by the fact that in Europe in the 1920s, after World War I, there was mass unemployment and misery and not to mention communism spreading and after the Russian Revolution, people were going, well, you know, capitalism never works. And look at, look at you people, you don't have jobs. But we have jobs for everybody in, in the Soviet Union. So that kind of pressure was there. And Keynes was thinking, how could we solve this? And one of his proposals uh, was, that he, I mean, he says it's half joking, but he does say it. He says, why don't you have the finance ministers of every country drop money from an airplane so if people will pick it up and they'll spend it and you'll get a multiplier. And another one, he says, you bury money in, in uh, uh, deep mines and then capitalists will pay people to dig it up and people will have jobs and the capitalists will get the return and all that. So that's the germ of the idea that effective demand can stimulate output and employment. And from this idea, comes the notion that you can stimulate it and something interesting happens. The first country to apply this is Hitler's Germany. Hitler's finance minister, Schacht, uh, creates deficit spending and Hitler is able in one year to eliminate massive unemployment in Germany, which had crushed the previous government leading to hyperinflation. They were printing money and all that. Hitler was able to change it in one year. And he says, his, his finance minister says, if I'm, remember, if I'm remember for anything, nothing else, it should be this, that I eliminated unemployment. Now, that's Hitler's. World War II, massive rise in output employment, deficit spending, money, everybody was urged to save their money and give it to the government so the government could spend it. So all consumption was reduced, savings was increased, and that savings was monetized and spent by the government instead of going into finance. It went into output and employment. So you got an injection of purchasing power, right? That injection of purchasing power uh, led to a tremendous rise in employment and output. The war machine was extremely efficient and good, and output rose, and deficits rose. and didn't have any problem with uh, inflation, no slowdown. So that's the beginning of my graph, 1947, 1949. They're coming off that. So it seemed that you had these two great instances of Keynesian 
effective Keynesian policy. The problem is that the same Keynesians were now in charge of the economy in the 1950s and they applied the same policies and they worked in the beginning. So you had the pumping up. I showed you on the, the Vietnam War, if you remember, a great Vietnam War deficit stimulus moved you up the curve. So Vietnam War deficit starts in 65. It moves you back up this curve, which of course means the rate of change of the wage share, positive increase is, is rising. Uh, but then after the deficit, uh, the war financing winds down, you come back. So you are in this region of war, ri wages rising faster than productivity. And Keynes don't see any problem with that because expectations determine the in profit rate. And they don't, their theory of interest rate is liquidity preference, so there's no problem, except for the fact that capitalism had a problem. Because as they did this in the 60s and 70s, inflation, uh, unemployment went down, uh, the reserve army, the unemployment rate went down, the labor market got tighter, wages were rising faster than productivity, profitability was falling, and growth started to slow down. As growth started to slow down, they had what they called stagnation. Growth slowing down, but they were pumping even more, so what you're getting is more and more inflation. And I'm going to develop that, I won't develop that here, but the relation between the growth rate and the and the profit rate is a key to the theory of inflation. But basically, if your growth rate is slowing down and you're pumping the economy more, you're going to get grow, uh, inflation. So that was the explanation of stagflation. Now we can jump ahead to, say, Brazil recently, uh, two successive Lula governments, uh, post-Keynesian economists in charge. Uh, and they, by the way, studied at the New School. And they did what the theory said would work, which is to pump up the economy. Uh, give money from the top to the bottom, which increase consumption spending because people uh, consume more, the poorer people than rich people. They uh, uh, created uh, means of financing uh, output in employment. And for five or six years, that pumped up the economy and then it began to die out. The growth rate began to fall, unemployment came back, they had inflation, and they couldn't explain it. Now, Argentina also, but I don't have the data on Argentina yet, but the point is that you have five instances, six instances, and they partition in a nice way. In Hitler's time, prices were not allowed to rise, and you didn't mess around with Hitler. He said prices are not rising, they didn't rise. Wages were not allowed to rise relative to productivity. In fact, the wage share fell under Hitler, and the profit rate under Hitler rose sharply, so that there was no limit from the real economy feedback to the stimulus. In World War II, they did the same thing. You were not allowed to raise prices because it would be war profiteering and the penalties were severe. You were also not allowed to raise wages because that would be, again, fighting against the interests of the nation. You were urged to work as hard as possible as Hitler did too. So productivity rose, wages were uh, rising slowly or not at all, profitability was rising. And so the limit to the stimulus was stopped. And was stopped through policy. But of course the question is whether you can do that forever. Now I do have to go, oops, okay. So I'm gonna argue, I'm gonna pick this up next time and I wanna show you that this explanation incorporates the Keynesian story, has a theory of inflation, but also, most importantly, has a theory of the limits to stimulus, the limits to the kind of intervention of the state, and that's something to keep in mind. I'll pick this up next time.